He's in the building! <laughs> Drink the moment. Drink it. I said, empty your mind. Coquettish and coy. Ow. Ow. What? Yeah, there's people that are dying. The wickedly talented. More than great. It was historic. Crack is world. Oh, good for you. I have to apologize. One of the hottest. Hello and welcome back to The Reheat, a podcast that re-examines the hottest celebrity news and scandals of yesteryear and asks, how would we react to the same events if they transpired today? I'm your co-host, Sadaf Hassan. And I'm Sarah Sahagian. This week, we're discussing the uncommon story of Catherine, the Duchess of Cambridge, the royal more commonly referred to as Kate Middleton. The first commoner to marry an heir to the British throne in modern history, she will one day be queen. And for the purposes of simplicity and because it's what I'm used to calling her, we too will refer to the Duchess as Kate today. So Sadaf, what do you know about Kate Middleton? What are your initial impressions of who she is as we start this episode? Well, I remember when she came along and it was kind of the first time that I really took an interest in, I guess, our generation of royals. And Mm -hmm. I just thought that she, what I understood was that she was a quote unquote commoner. I didn't know how accurate that was at the time. I just thought she was cute. I thought she had a nice smile. She has dimples, right? And I feel like, you know, I can trust anybody who has dimples. (laughs) I was like, yeah, okay, sure, why not? And they looked cute together. I liked their story. But I got to say, and I know we're going to get to it, but like years later and just kind of knowing and hearing about how she's treated Meghan Markle, now I'm just a big no to Kate Middleton. (laughs) But it started off well. Well, we will talk about her evolution. And um, I'm curious to hear what you you think about her at the end. Um, But her family is a lot more interesting than I thought they would be, frankly. So in her best-selling 2022 book, The Palace Papers, Tina Brown argues, quote, the Middletons represent aspiration in the best possible way. The story of Kate's lineage is one of the greatest rags to riches stories in British history. That's me talking. While Kate herself always had a comfortable life, her mother, Carol, came from truly humble beginnings. Carol's parents, Dorothy and Ron Goldsmith, descended from coal miners and people so impoverished they sometimes resorted to subsistence farming. Ron and Dorothy themselves were a working class couple who lived in a council house, a British form of government subsidized housing for lower income people, while saving money to buy their own home. And in some ways, they are the poster children for the social mobility this vital type of subsidized housing can foster when it's offered. Ron and Dorothy use subsidized housing to save enough money to buy a house, and a mere two generations later, their granddaughter has become a princess of the United Kingdom. Sadly, Britain's affordable housing program the same program that gave a future queen's family housing stability has since experienced severe cuts in the 21st century. Cash-strapped as they were, Ron and Dorothy still found the funds to spoil their beloved daughter, Carol. When baby Carol was born in 1955, they bought her a top-of-the-line silver cross pram, the same pram the royal family used. How prescient. Carol was always bright, but her family's modest means meant that the idea of getting university education was unrealistic. Instead, she became a flight attendant, which was an incredibly competitive field in the 1970s. While working for British Airways, now as a part of their ground crew, she met the comparatively posh Michael Middleton, a flight dispatcher. The way royal reporter Katie Nichol explains it in her book, Kate the Future Queen, the Goldsmiths were delighted at the upper middle class status their daughter secured through marriage. We must remember that Britain is a society where class is deeply ingrained and marrying outside of one's class of birth is not easy even today and certainly wasn't in the 1980s. The newlywed Middleton settled in the historic county of Berkshire. As a couple, Katie Nichol describes the Middletons as always being royalists. In fact, Carol watched the 1981 wedding of Lady Diana Spencer to Prince Charles while pregnant with her firstborn child, the baby who would turn out to be Kate when she was born in 1982. So Sadaf, so far, does Kate's origin story almost feel like it was written by the Hallmark Channel? Could this narrative be any more of a fairy tale? No, it totally does. I mean, it's kind of crazy, the evolution. I don't think I knew that much about it at the time. Like, I knew that she came from a different 
quote unquote class as obviously the royals. I feel like you kind of have to if you're marrying into the royal family, mm, yeah. but this is quite a jump, right? And there is something that's so romantic about it. Well, there's just something so perfect about your mom's pregnant with you and she watches the wedding of your future in-laws. But then I do wonder though, I mean, how many people living in the UK are probably did watch it. Oh, they all did. Do, so right? I guess yeah. you could have said this about any commoner. <laughs> I hate to burst <laughs> really. in the bubble. Fair enough, burst. fair enough. They were all watching it. <laughs> like I, anybody who was pregnant, if their daughter had gone on to marry him, could have told this anecdote. But may, hey, maybe not fantasizing about it. I'm sure there's plenty sitting there like, oh, fuck them. But then, you know. Yeah, people hate watched it. Carol yeah. wasn't hate watching it. She was love watching this wedding. Carol liked the royal family. Yeah, there we go. So when Kay was really young, Michael relocated the family to Jordan, where he secured a better paying position. The family stayed for roughly two years, with Kate attending preschool in Amman. When the Middletons returned to the UK, it was Carol who made the family truly rich. A busy mom of three to Kate and her younger siblings, Pippa and James, Carol began creating and selling boxes of supplies for children's birthday parties. Carol literally started her business, Party Pieces, at the family's kitchen table. By 2018, Party Pieces was worth approximately $40 million, according to Town & Country magazine. Oh my God. Yeah, this is a real <laughs> self-made woman. She reminds you of Martha Stewart or Kris Jenner. Later on, it's more Kris Jenner, but at the beginning, it's definitely Martha Stewart. I believe it. In a rare interview, Carol Middleton told Sherlock's in February 2022... Quote, being a mother meant I understood how children's parties worked from the point of view of the parent organizing them and the children who wanted to enjoy themselves. I wanted to make it as easy as possible for parents to create the perfect party for their children. So that's what inspired her to start Party Pieces, and it's been a profitable venture for her. With their new wealth, the Middletons bought a spacious home in the well-to-do village of Bucklebury. They also took glamorous family vacations to destinations like Barbados. In her youth, Kate was an enthusiastic and bright student who acted in school plays. At age 10, she portrayed Eliza Doolittle in a production of My Fair Lady, a play about a woman from humble beginnings who learns the manners of a princess. How's that for foreshadowing? I mean, there's too much of it. It's thick. (laughs) She was never like truly in poverty or anything. She was always upper middle class, but Definitely, there is this theme in Kate's life of just constant social mobility, right? And it gets even more astronomical as she goes on and gets older. The multi-talented Kate also excelled in several sports, including hockey, netball, and tennis. However, she wasn't just a high-achieving co-curricular machine. Kate loved the British sitcom Absolutely Fabulous and was known at school for her Joanna Lumley impression, which makes me like Kate more. That's actually quite endearing. Me too, and I like AbFab, so I'm kind of like, okay, okay, Kate's Mm -hmm. got a personality. Yeah, she's kind of relatable when you hear that. And also, Sadaf, you'll love this. Her favorite movie was Tom Cruise's Cocktail. Oh, I do love that. See, now you're, what you're doing is dangerous. You're making me like Kate Middleton, and I never thought that I would get there. Oh, I boy. feel like the two of you could hang out and have fun. We probably could have a very good time. <laughs> a very good time. Uh, for secondary school, Kate attended the prestigious Marlborough College. I have a hard time saying that. <laughs> a co-ed boarding school founded in 1843, and the same institution princesses Eugenie and Beatrice would later attend. Fancy. In addition to excelling at sports and receiving good grades, Kate was known for her physical beauty. By age 16, she was at the top of the, quote, fit list, a problematic <laughs> list ranking the most conventionally attractive girls in school. However, Kate was a bit less popular with the boys than her younger sister, Pippa. Pippa was even more athletic than Kate and did slightly better academically, but there seems to be a consensus there wasn't much jealousy on Kate's part. By most accounts, the sisters got on well. Ultimately, both sisters became school legends, with Kate being voted, quote, most likely to be loved by everybody. Wow. There's a lot. There, that's very prescient, too. Yeah. Yes. Like, this girl was always beloved. And there, we always go back and retcon people's views when they end up becoming incredibly famous. Like, oh, they were destined for this. It really yeah. does feel like Kate was destined for this. Like, It's almost like she was factory made for William. Like, it's just, it's so, wow. Yeah, I, she was kind of made in the lab for this job. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. So does 
anything about Kate's upbringing surprise you so far? Was she more privileged than you thought she'd be, given how the media, you know, referred to her as common in the early days? Yeah, she absolutely is. I, I was saying it before, but in my mind, I had completely pictured her as a, again, quote unquote commoner. I think also though, because I wanted to buy into the fantasy of it all, right? And like we were saying, being on either side of the, uh, what is it? The train tracks or whatever like that. Yeah. Kind of, like I bought into that back then and I thought there was such a romance too. And I loved the idea of that, but this woman was loaded. She was doing amazing. That's not the story at all. No, it's not. But one thing that's important to remember in British high society, because she's marrying into the monarchy, which is the most staid and retrograde institution in the world, arguably. One thing to remember is that new money is considered a different class in Britain, right? right? And her family, most of it was pretty new. I mean, her family came, her father came from an upper middle class background. Um, His family had done well, but they weren't, you know, they they weren't really rich. Mm. And Carol with her extraordinary work ethic, because from my research, I've gotten the impression that Carol worked really friggin' hard, uh, made them rich. It's one of the, Carol is like one of the few meritocratic successes I can actually think of where like yeah. people weren't really giving her a hand up between taking her kids to their lessons and making dinner. She was just planning a business at the kitchen table. She didn't even have an office. Like that's actually really impressive. It is. And by the way, I really appreciate that distinction. That's really interesting when you put it that way. And Yeah, I just want to hear more about Carol. She sounds like the fascinating one. Yeah, she worked hard for her money so her children wouldn't have to, is kind of the impression I get from her. Like, she gave them new money so that they could go off and become old money, Um, which I guess, like, in Britain, when you grow up and old money is so venerated, that's maybe the dream. I don't know. Like, but it seems like that's what she was doing. Yeah, Yeah. So the academically minded Kate was determined to study history of art. So she set her sights on the University of Edinburgh, which had the UK's top art history program. Since Kate's best friends from Marlborough also planned to attend Edinburgh, it seemed like the perfect choice. Kate got in, but at the last minute, she decided not to accept her offer. Instead, she took a last minute gap year before university and decided to apply to St. Andrews instead. And St. Andrews was the university where it just so happened Prince William would be studying after his gap year, so they would be starting at the same time. Wow. The debate over whether Kate switched her sights to St. Andrews to pursue William specifically has never really been resolved. Oh. There is a popular theory that Carol in a fit of social climbing, insisted her daughter (laughs) throw away her more prestigious university acceptance for her chance at dating the future king. Oh, wow. In the Palace Papers, Tina Brown suggests William was indeed Carol's motivation. According to Brown, quote, Carol has considerable strategic flair, end quote. And while I don't doubt Carol's strategic talents in the world of business, not everyone believes she was a modern-day Boleyn plotting to have her daughter marry a king. Katie Nichols, an authorized biographer to the Duchess of Cambridge, whom I've mentioned previously, has her doubts about that theory. So that's one person who doubts it. And frankly, so do I. And here's my explanation for why I doubt that theory. Reports suggest Kate was likely still hung up on her high school boyfriend, Harry, when she began university at St. Andrews. It is quite possible that Kate simply decided she wanted the small town university experience St. Andrews offered rather than the hustle and bustle of Edinburgh. So, Sadaf, do you believe Carol plotted to have her daughter marry a prince, or do you think it was just a coincidence that Kate changed her mind and decided to attend the same school as Prince William? Well, listen, Tina Brown can convince me of absolutely anything she wants, even complete garbage, which sometimes she does peddle, and I love that woman. So I'm twofold here. So I think Carol might have had this in mind, because I think Carol experienced a huge upswing. She became a very wealthy mm-hmm. woman, living a very posh life. Maybe this was something she thought about because I think parents at that stage, they're definitely thinking, how can the next generation of mine take this a step further? Kind of a great plan, very flawlessly executed. But I feel like if it's Kate we're talking about, I don't think, I have a hard time believing that that was in her head. Maybe her mom suggested to her, but I don't know. I mean, also, you know, at the same time, who wants to choose a small town university over the city. I, I don't know, but that's also me projecting. But I, I just... did. I made that decision. Like, what okay. Kate did, I was going to go to U of T, UBC, or McGill. And yeah. then at the last minute, I decided I wanted to go to Queens because I thought, okay, when else am I going to live in a small town? And it's true. I've never lived in a small town again. When you are that age, you make such weird 
rash decisions that are so impulsive. Yeah. And I don't regret my decision. I, it truly, it really doesn't matter where you go to university. Yeah, that's also <laughs> it true. It doesn't. Yeah, and you think no. it does when you're a teen and it really yeah. doesn't. Um, but I also like made that impulsive decision. Uh, so I can relate to her where you just like, you work so hard for something and then you just, you get it and you're like, now I want something else. But that that's great because that, that adds even more to my original theory that I don't think Kate had that plan. Maybe her mom did. I think Kate just wanted a gap year and then just switched her plan. And I think you're right. She probably was still hung up on this Harry who is not William's brother. And no, so again, yeah, I just don't believe it. I don't think I don't think girls that age think like that. And considering like what her life had been up until that point, how I'm gathering her personality was. Again, I'm making a lot of assumptions. I just don't believe she would go that far. You'd have to be plotting for a very long time, I think, to make this big of a change in your life, just to hopefully maybe marry the prince. And you don't even know if you're his type, right? You don't, you've never, she didn't know him. So how, and Carol certainly didn't know him. Like, so how would you know if he would like you? Yes, Kate was always beautiful, but really, honestly, attraction is much more complicated than that. So it's so weird that, there are these classes within this incredibly privileged group of rich white people, right? (laughs) It's so bizarre that there is this hierarchy, but there, but there is. And the way I think the Middletons have been treated in the press and they're portrayed as, you know, these Machiavellian modern day Berlins, I think buys into that, this idea that the prince wouldn't marry a commoner unless her family schemed to make it happen, right? Like, as though he doesn't have agency here. Well, I mean, they're not allowed to, right? Because then I go back to Charles, too. I mean, if he got to have agency over he could be with, we would have a very different story in front of us right now, right? That is true. Although there was, and we'll talk a bit about this later, the family had evolved. And I think that the public didn't realize how much the family had evolved. Um, But by the time William met Kate, they were much more concerned with him finding a marriage that would last and finding a certain type of woman because divorce had just devastated the family in the press and almost destroyed the monarchy. So when Kate arrived at St. Andrews, Freshers Week in 2001, she was immediately popular. Her nickname was, quote, Beautiful Kate. God, what an easy life to live. I just, I can't. Yes, anyway. her nickname was Beautiful Kate. That's her actual nickname. Of course so it people was. Call it, can you imagine just people coming up to me and being like, hey, Beautiful, beautiful Kate. Kate. <laughs> it's a weird nickname. Like, it's creepy. Um <laughs> Um, And in fact, it was actually William who first approached Kate, not vice versa. William was so intimidated by her, it took him a couple of weeks of school to summon the courage to ask her to join him and his friends for breakfast. Yeah, it's kind of sweet. Like, this is somebody who's probably never worried he wasn't good enough for another person in his life. And then he was, like, intimidated by Kate. I love that. She was just so beautiful, Sarah. (laughs) (laughs) I have seen her in person. Um, Oh, right, you have. Okay, I went, I'll just tell the story quickly. Yeah, please. Uh, When they came on their first tour to Canada, I was visiting a friend for um, the Canada Day long weekend, just because, you know, it's a long weekend, you get it off. And she lived in Ottawa. So I I took advantage of it. And she tricked me (laughs) into going to see them. So I, listen, my mom took me to see Prince Charles as a four-year-old. I I did not ask. She claims I asked to go see Prince Charles. There's no, I did (laughs) not. Four years old. I did not do that. But I did meet him as a four-year-old. Um, and I remembered how crowded it was and how tedious it was waiting. So I had no interest in going and, you know, hanging out in the throngs and trying to see them. It was yeah. a really hot day. But my friend picked a certain restaurant for brunch and then decided we should do takeout and eat the food on the street. And then it turned out that that was the route that their carriage was coming down, which oh, I didn't wow. know. Yeah. Um, So I did see her. um, And she was very, very beautiful, even with like a slight sunburn, because I think she'd (laughs) underestimated the Canadian heat. That's how flawless this woman is. My God. Oh, the power of dimples, I'm telling you. Okay. So at first, when they met at St. Andrews, Kate and William were just friends. They bonded over their love of outdoor pursuits, traded gap year stories, and enjoyed a mutual love of healthy breakfast foods like muesli cereal instead of sausage. Wow. So many of the St. Andrews students would have like the fry up, which is definitely what I would have eaten. But anyway, yeah, Kate and William liked muesli. That's they were fine. mutually boring. <laughs> Yeah, absolutely. That's fine if that, you know, eat what makes you happy. Um, Soon they began swimming together in the mornings. So they also worked out together, but they still weren't a couple. In fact, the first boy Kate became involved with at St. Andrews was an upper year student named Rupert. 
According to reports, the first time William tried to kiss Kate at a party, she pushed him away because she was still dating Rupert. Oh my God, William, you dog. I know. Rupert, like these names are so English. (laughs) Wow. (laughs) I know Kate's the only person here who has a normal name. (laughs) But then she has Middleton. I mean, Middleton is like right out of a fairy tale book. My God. So Tina Brown believes that Kate was playing hard to get, and this was all part of some sort of a strategy that the Middletons created. However, I have never met a 19-year-old who is that shrewd. (laughs) If this is true, Kate shouldn't be a princess, but should have been recruited by MI6 or like should be the prime minister because she is a friggin' strategic genius if this is true. Yeah, this is not Gossip Girl. Tina Brown thinks everyone's a schemer, which which is adorable. I mean, I wish that was the case. That would be fun. She projects. She thinks everyone thinks the way she thinks, right? Oh, um, yeah. And most people are not that canny. I'm sorry. Like, and you know, it's actually sweet that Tina thinks that much of other people. <laughs> but like, I, you know, I've read the Vanity Fair diaries or whatever that Me is too, called. Yeah. And, you know, she really is a schemer and more power to her. She's great at it. Extremely, um, yeah. But most people don't think like that. No, they don't. God, no. Tina Brown lives in her own, lives in a movie of her own making. Like, that's a different planet. Yeah, but at the end of the day, her world is definitely more interesting than ours. And I would love to be in it. Yeah. <laughs> so if Kate really was playing hard to get, the plan was ingenious, I have to say. If this actually was true and she it was all a strategy, I don't don't think it was, but if it was, it was yeah. just inspired. William was used to people fawning all over him. And while Kate seemed to like him as a person, she didn't seem impressed by William. Oh, I love it. Yeah. So that is something that, you know, that's an aphrodisiac if you're a young prince. Yeah. And of course, what episode about Kate Middleton would be complete without going into her lingerie moment? According to varied media outlets from Vogue to tabloids like The Mirror, Kate made William officially obsessed with her when she strutted down the catwalk of a St. Andrew's charity fashion show in a see-through dress. According to Lore, William, who was seated in the front row, exclaimed to his friend Fergus, wow, Fergus, Kate's hot. Fergus. Sorry, go on. I just. (laughs) (laughs) I know, I know all the names. Nonetheless, there isn't a public consensus about when and how Kate and William began dating. When Kate moved into the flat William shared with friends in their second year, they probably still weren't a romantic item. In fact, William claims he attempted to woo Kate by trying and failing to cook her fancy dinners in their flat share. In their 2010 post-engagement interview, William told interviewer Tom Bradby, quote, what would happen was I was bur- what would happen was I would burn something, something would overspill, something would catch on fire. She would be sitting in the background trying to help and basically taking control of the whole situation. So I mean, that is hot. Like I get that, right? In a sense, in a way. I mean, I okay. I like men who can cook. I can try to put myself. Yeah, I like men who can cook, so that kind of ineptitude in the kitchen because I'm not a good cook would not impress me. I'd be like, one of us has to be able to cook. I mean, for him, I think, yeah, I think for him, like her, her behavior would be very attractive. If I were her, though, which I guess I would be in this situation, (laughs) I would be, I wouldn't be very repulsed. Yeah, I would not be into it. So whoever made the first move and however they did it, by 2002, William and Kate were officially dating. The two kept their relationship quiet in the beginning, but when the duo were photographed on a ski holiday in Switzerland in 2004, the game was up. The cover of Britain's The Sun read, quote, finally, Wills gets a girl. Like, I love the way they just sort of assume he'd been living the life of a monk until then. Well, I would like to believe that he was a little bit of a hoe. Like, I hope that's what was happening. I know that's Harry's reputation. But like, come on, you were living like this? Like, you had your own space. You're a prince. I feel like he had some game. He must have if he could pull beautiful Kate. So I want to believe that. I mean, I'm sure he, I'm sure he did fine. I'm sure he did okay. (laughs) I mean, he was a prince. Like, I I think that that helped (laughs) He was a prince. At the end of the day. Tina Brown argues that William wasn't just attracted to Kate because she was the most beautiful girl in school, but also because she was, quote, steadfast. She had this quality that was calm and serene and confident. She'd grown up with a loving, stable family, the kind of childhood William didn't have. His own youth, with the tragic loss of his mother, was chaotic. And Kate gave him stability for the first time in his life, arguably. But here's another question. 
how much of their story can we even know, right? Like, how do we know what's true and what's just sort of being kind of leaked by the palace? I don't really buy any of it, to be honest with you. I feel like even in post-engagement interviews, and I know how big that is for them now, Mm -hmm. it's like, that must have been rehearsed endlessly. Oh, for sure. Listen, it's interesting that they told the anecdote about like, I tried to impress her by cooking for her and not, I tried to kiss her at a party and she rebuffed my advances, right? Like they're yeah. presenting it in a certain way that's really cute and wholesome. And, and like, listen, fair enough. Like I don't want to tell the more unsavory parts of my relationship that like are kind of embarrassing on national television either. Yeah. Like. I met my husband on a dating app. If if I were the heir to the British throne, I don't know if I would say that on ITV. Yeah. Like, there's nothing wrong with meeting young people on dating apps. I married someone I met on one, but I probably wouldn't emphasize that. Yeah, no, you're totally right. Like, we all edit things, right? But then their whole image that they present is extra, quote unquote, photoshopped. Like, I remember when that moment when she's on the catwalk at the mm-hmm. at the school fashion show, when that moment leaked or came mm-hmm. out or however it did. I remember there was a huge media camp that was kind of calling her or sort of slut shaming her for even doing that in the first place. It was so bizarre. But then when you actually watch the video, there's nothing in it that's even remotely no. explicit or crazy. It's just a pretty typical school fashion show. So everything is spun in a certain way. And I mean, we know the UK media especially is completely out of control, right? Yeah, absolutely. So when Will and Kate's relationship went public, Kate became a lightning rod for paparazzi attention. After graduating from St. Andrews, she moved to London where her parents had purchased her an apartment in the swanky neighborhood of Chelsea. Uh, The paps were regularly camped out at her apartment, taking pictures of her leaving for work or taking out the garbage. It wasn't unheard of for them to follow her down the street or harass her late at night. Her phone was also hacked by the tabloids over 150 times between 2005 and 2006. Unfortunately, being a royal girlfriend meant that while she was an object of fascination for the British public, she didn't qualify for royal protection. So that admittedly must have been hard. Like that sounds like a really challenging situation. And it went on for a really long time uh, because they dated for a really long time. Yeah. As was customary for the Windsors, William went on to Sandhurst after St. Andrews, where he completed his royal military training. If you believe Tina Brown, Kate deliberately neglected her career in her 20s to keep her schedule flexible so she could be available for William during his breaks from the military. Uh, She worked part-time as an accessories buyer at the high street clothing chain Jigsaw, um, which, you know, I lived in Britain for a time. That's a, it's a good chain. They have nice stuff. She also did some work for party pieces, but what Kate was best known for in this era was her own wardrobe. It was full of eye-catching high street clothes. Quote, the Kate effect was used to refer to how when she wore something cute from a high street shop, whether it was, you know, whistles or a Zara, it just sold out immediately. As a longtime girlfriend of the prince, Kate was dubbed, quote, Weighty Katie by the UK press, a derisive moniker used to highlight the fact that Wills had yet to propose after several years of dating. The fact that it's normal for people in their mid-20s to feel unready to get married didn't seem to register for the British press. Some of William's friends also believed Kate wasn't good enough for him and referred to both Kate and her sister Pippa as, quote, the Wisteria Sisters, a reference to a plant that is beautiful and fragrant, but also very good at climbing. That's clever, I have to say. It's, I mean, it's, <laughs> it's clever. It's terrible, but it makes me It's also me like, up. Classist and misogynistic. <laughs> yeah, it's pretty terrible. It's terrible. Yeah, it, it, yeah it's terrible. <laughs> I remember when this was happening and I remember the Weighty Katie nickname as well and this supposed idea that she was just obsessed with William and just dying for the proposal. I remember all of this. Mm-hmm. Meanwhile, it's like, why can't we reverse the story? Mm-hmm. <laughs> and we Again, we don't know those details, but... Yeah, I think what's sad about it is at that time, I thought that that was really egregious. But then years later, when you see what's happening to Meghan Markle, that's that's egregious on a whole other beyond level. So it just, in my opinion, it seems excruciating to be in this family and want to be in this family unless you're like in the family already. Like you need some kind of incestuous hookup just to maybe be validated <laughs> in terms mm-hmm. of where you're from, how much money you have, what class you have, because they only seem to like their own people. Um, it just seems impossible. Yeah, I mean, what they really wanted, it seemed, was another Diana. And she, you know, looks wise, stunning, right? Yeah. So on that level, very similar to Diana, but 
she wasn't the daughter of an earl. And for some reason, that seemed to make a difference in how she was portrayed in the in the press. Like the press has this, I, I don't even know if it's conscious classism because most of the people writing these headlines and most and the huge majority of people reading them were not nobles, right? Like they were commoners too. Yeah. So yeah. why would they want to why would they want to eviscerate someone for being a commoner? Well, like you, I guess if you grow up in this highly classist society, you you kind of internalize it a little bit. Yeah, and I think too, it, it, there's such an irony to this, but I was kind of pointing at it earlier, but even in this way that this is all a fantasy and it's all a fairy tale that mm-hmm. we really enjoy and the royals are that for us. I think there's a part of it too that's if they can't be happy, then can we be happy? And if they have this whole kind of gap between them. How do they get there? Well, it's more exciting when we watch them fight for it and quote unquote Mm -hmm. earn it. And there's so much more to that. And again, it's like we have to give them some strife. Sometimes I feel like that's part of the media's role when it comes to the UK tabloid system. And what they make you want more, they make you crave it because they're saying, when will she ever get the proposal? Meanwhile, they're Mm -hmm. living a perfectly happy, fine relationship. I don't even know that it was an issue for them, but it makes them more exciting and makes them more Mm -hmm fun for us. Um, But I think inside the family, my theory has always been that there's just nobody who could ever be perfect for them. And I think that's also misogyny talking, right? Because I think that's especially the case for the women in the family. Like, you have to be some kind of flawless mix of every woman who was there before. And there's never going to be another Elizabeth. So... (laughs) While she was dating William, the royal family liked Kate very much. She had universal approval. I mean, Charles thought she was fantastic, as did William's brother, Harry. However, the Windsors were concerned about William getting married too young. So this was a complication. After the disastrous divorce of his parents, it seemed possible that the British monarchy wouldn't survive the dissolution of another heir's marriage. With this note of caution from his family, William decided to break up with Kate, the only serious girlfriend he'd ever had, and play the field. Will and Kate's breakup lasted for approximately eight weeks. By June of 2007, the pair had reconciled. So in this case, I think the Middletons truly did employ a strategy. Yeah. Uh, during the breakup, Carol encouraged her daughter to be seen out and about at nightclubs with her girlfriends and friends. So here she's, you know, being the Chris Jenner in the background. <laughs> um, on these outings, Kate was seen sporting short skirts and big smiles. Kate also joined a dragon boat crew called the Sisterhood, oh. who were preparing to cross the English Channel to raise money for children's charities. The plan worked, and William immediately realized what a catch his ex-girlfriend was. When the couple reunited, William assured Kate that they would be in a marriage track relationship and asked for a few years to get his military career underway, after which he promised to propose. So how instrumental do we think Carol's advice was in making William want Kate back? Do we really believe it was this easy to make him jealous or do we think that he just never really wanted to break up with her and that's why he asked for her back so quickly? Like, was it Carol or was it just he was secretly always sure that Kate was the one. I think she absolutely was involved here. She was playing them like chess pieces. I think, listen, they had an eight-week split. Even if you're not a fucking prince, that's not easy. Like, in that gap of time, you will miss this person. And if they're also on the cover of tabloids, if the press is talking about them and you're hearing about them, you don't really get time to move on. So, and it also sounds like they really did love each other. Like, there was something that was really strong and deep there. And so maybe he did feel jealous. And it makes sense to me that they found their way back to each other. But I also remember when this was happening. And even I remember being like, God damn it, get it together. (laughs) Just call a date and propose. You know, I think here, this pragmatic approach to love and loving the one you're with is actually something that well-adjusted people do. Oh my God. Um, Are we saying they're well-adjusted? I don't know. I think Kate is. I don't know I if think he Kate is. is. I think Kate is. I think Kate is, which is, I think, why she didn't just move on and decide to bag a billionaire, which I have no mm. doubt she could have accomplished. Yeah. Um, and then in William's case, I think, I have no idea how smart he is, but I have to assume he was self-aware enough to know that he was never going to find someone who 
was steadier and more reliable than Kate. Like somebody who just knew how to do this job, knew how to be his partner and wanted to take it on. Like Harry even said before Meghan, he had a hard time finding women who wanted to take on the royal life. And he could have found them, but he had a hard time finding women that he thought wanted it for the right reasons, Mm. right? Like there are a lot of people who in general, not just women, I'm not just saying women are social climbers. There are men who would marry princesses for the wrong reasons too. But there are a lot of people in general who like the idea of the royal family for the wrong reasons and don't truly understand what the rule entails, which is like, yes, there are a ton of perks, but there's a lot of boring stuff, right? Um, And there's a lot of press scrutiny. And you have to be really strong to withstand that. And also, you kind of have to be a glutton for punishment to be okay with it. Like, I wouldn't be okay with that. And Diana wasn't okay with that. Megan wasn't okay with that. But Kate seems okay with it. Yeah, I mean, this is the thing that always gets me is... I don't think I would ever go through with this. I mean, this is this is a conversation we can have later on a Friday night, but I feel like <laughs> I would never do this. I just, you're giving up so much. You're going to be put through hell. You essentially are giving up even having a career and whatever dream and wish you originally had is replaced with this fantasy life, which yeah. maybe is a fantasy life. How the hell should I know? But again, it seems that she was willing to do it and he felt she could do it. And maybe that was enough because listen, for average people, it's hard enough to find someone who's going to be your fit. Now imagine that you have this world as an audience and you also live this kind of really ridiculous life. It must be 10 times harder, I would imagine. Well, here's another question specifically from our producer, Joe. Thank you, Joe, for this question. How creepy is it that the mom, Kate's mom, seem to be quarterbacking this whole thing and the one who engineered them getting back together by training Kate to like play the girls just want to have fun recently broken up character. See, we have to mention Joe because we wouldn't use the word quarterback. <laughs> <laughs> no, we wouldn't. That's the top. Um, it's, you know what? It's creepy, but I'm also South Asian. And I know how invested parents can get and feel like they are also in that relationship. They are also in that marriage. So mm-hmm. I think this might be more common than people think, but I do find it very chilling. At the same time, I find it kind of weirdly sweet. Mm-hmm. At the same time, I find it so admirable, just in a w- villainous kind of way, where I'm like, yes, this bitch is calculating. Well done. She masterminded all all of this. And again, I'm going to walk away from this just wanting to know more about her. Well, here's the thing, though. One of the reasons why I think that this was needed, Kate needed some help here, is because she ran the risk, given that she was such a famous person and was dumped, of becoming a caricature in the press, like becoming just sort of this meme of a sad, rejected woman. And if you want your daughter to be able to bounce back and have a career and date other people and enjoy her life, you really don't want her to get stuck playing that role in the press for very long, right? Like the British press is vicious. So this was actually, it was important for her future. Like I, Mm. I don't think that it's a superficial concern. If you are known as, you know, the woman... William dated and, you know, the pathetic reject who never got over him, that would stigmatize you for life. The British press is horrible. That's true. Also, Carol was like, listen, I think, I think Carol realized that Kate didn't have great career experience at this point. Whether she (laughs) torpedoed her career intentionally to spend more time with William or she just like wasn't super ambitious and into climbing the corporate ladder, this woman could not look after herself in the style she'd been raised, right? Like she was That's great. Yeah, she wasn't going to be like Carol. She wasn't going to start a multi-million pound business. She needed to marry someone who could look after her. So her stock on the marriage market <laughs> needed to be high. She needed to go out and look hot in tap shots. Like she needed to do that. Either get back yes. to William or find a billionaire to marry you. Because like this woman was not making her own money. That's, oh, and I'm not right trying to be on. sexist. You shouldn't have to, but she was used to a certain lifestyle and didn't seem to want to work profitable jobs. No, that's delicious. I think you're totally right. It's not a gender thing. Parents know what they're dealing with. You know, your kid turns a certain age. I think you know what you've got yeah. in front of you. And you're going to do what you can. Yeah, yeah. You're like, my kid doesn't have any hustle. Like, I have Or they're, maybe they're dumb. You know, it could be any kind of thing. <laughs> Those are the realities. And if that can help you get somewhere, oh my God, by all means. So I, I again, love it for Carol. Love that she thought ahead like this. Yeah, like she is the, British aristocratic version of Chris Jenner. She yeah. got her children into, you know, the royal family, <laughs> into these circles. Like she has 
I mean, she's remarkable, really. Yeah. So in October of 2010, William finally presented Kate with his mother's famous sapphire and diamond engagement ring at the foothills of Mount Kenya. That's where he proposed. To me, it's a little weird that he proposed with a cursed ring because his parents got divorced and then his mother very tragically died. Yeah. But I guess when you have family heirlooms, you might as well use them. Like, I think if I had more family heirlooms, this might seem less weird to me. Yeah, and it's Diana's ring. Like, if we even just strip Charles out of this, Diana wore that ring. I would want it to. I won't lie. But yeah, like, honestly, if we have any listeners who are thinking about proposing to someone, that person has to wear that ring forever. Let them pick it out. Like, honestly, just propose without the ring propose with a ring pop and then let them pick out the ring if you want to buy them a ring. That's cute. I also suggest go talk to their best friend or their sibling or like someone who's really close to them in their life and get them to help you pick one out. Don't do it yourself if you have really poor taste. Okay, think about it. Think (laughs) about it. Exactly. Think about that. So Kate and Will's post-engagement ITV interview was the first time most Brits had ever heard Kate speak. And that's kind of weird because she was already a household name. That, yeah. uh, that is strange, but this is the first time they really got to hear her speak. It's uh, three weeks ago on holiday in Kenya. Um, we had a little private time um, away together with some friends, and I just decided that it was the right time, really. Um, we've been talking about, about um, marriage for a while, so it wasn't a massively big surprise, but uh, I took her up somewhere nice in, uh, in Kenya and, uh, and proposed. It's very romantic. There's a true romantic in that. There is. <laughs> and you said yes, obviously. Of course, yes. Yeah. I mean, it's not a very enlightening clip. Like, you don't learn much about her. There's n- there are no real insights. But you do get to hear her voice, and it's her in an official interview. So, I like, this was big news, and it, it was pretty interesting for most people. Yeah, her actually saying, of course, yes, just took me back, because now I'm remembering how many times I heard and saw that clip and remember the breathless of course yes like I <laughs> oh that just took me back for a moment but yeah she could have said anything and it would have stuck in our heads basically at that point she doesn't come off as cool here it's funny because normally no. she's so calm and here she just comes off as like giddy to be engaged yeah 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 yeah. but I found that kind of charming at the yeah, time sweet. I thought oh sweet yeah yeah she just seems like a normal person normal. in her late 20s who's super excited to be engaged to the yeah. guy she's been dating forever yeah while most weddings are filled with drama the consensus is that Kate and Wills mostly wasn't. On April 29th, 2011, 1,900 in-person guests filled Westminster Abbey to watch the 29-year-old Kate become a princess by marriage. According to The Guardian, 18 million people tuned in on TV to watch Kate walk down the aisle in an Alexander McQueen gown that single-handedly ended the trend for strapless wedding dresses with sweetheart necklines. And I'm grateful for that because I wore like a lace dress with long sleeves. I don't like strapless dresses. I'm always worried they're going to fall off my body. So thank you, Kate. Same here, same here. Also, just want to do a shout out to the designer, Sarah Burton, who is amazing. And that dress was just oh. iconic. That dress was flawless. It was perfect on her. It started a great trend. Like, love that dress. Can't forget it. The Middletons had insisted on helping to pay for the wedding, which is which is cute. Um, contributing 250,000 pounds. Now, that would be a huge sum for most people, but a drop in the m- bucket for a wedding attended by dignitaries, royalty from around the world, and even Sir Elton John. As many mothers of the pride do, Carol Middleton cried when she saw her daughter on the big day. Kate walked down the aisle to I Was Glad by Sir Charles Hubert Hastings Perry. reminds me of old Hollywood depictions of royalty. Like, it just feels so cinematic that moment. What about you? It reminds me of, like, Phantom of the Opera. (laughs) It reminds me of something much worse. (laughs) But anyway. Well, because I also remember watching this wedding, and I remember the music specifically, and I remember thinking, Jesus, this is intense. But, I mean, it's the royals. They don't do anything lightly, so go figure. Yeah, you're right. Like, it is a little bit over the top. <laughs> but it is, okay, one thing that we have to understand is part of the reason why it's over the top is anytime the royals do a big event like this, it's simultaneously contemporary and historic. Like, they have to think, yeah. like, people will see this clip in 200 years and they'll watch it now. So how can we do justice to this moment in history, which, I mean, currently it's the present day, 
but it is going to be studied as an historic moment. So they have this weird tension. And that's why I think everything ends up being over the top and there's a lot of pageantry. Yeah, it's interesting. Who could forget how Pippa Middleton broke the internet when she... Um, wore that body-hugging dress when she was a bridesmaid at the wedding. That became one of the most talked about moments of Kate and William's wedding. Kate became her royal highness that day, but Pippa earned herself the nickname of, quote, her royal hotness in the press. I remember this. I just want to note that you have written the words shapely backside. <laughs> Wonderful. Oh, yeah. I Wonderful. <laughs> I second guess that. Yes, her shapely backside in that body hugging dress became quite famous. Um, she later married very well too. Yeah, and I, I remember a lot of the chatter about how incredibly beautiful she was. Even mm-hmm. discussion that perhaps William should have been marrying her. And I was just like, really? <laughs> and listen, I do think these women are attractive ladies, but really, are they the pinnacle of hotness? Like, I just anyway. That's where white privilege gets you, but it's very fascinating. Yeah. Well, yeah, that that's true. And like that for. A long time there was the speculation that she and Harry were together or I think it was people were shipping them like they weren't together and there was no reason to believe that but people were willing it into existence yeah yeah it's cute it's a cute idea it is cute but I mean Pippa was a money player like Pippa married a billionaire (laughs) So, money player harry doesn't have billions like listen if pippa did smart pippa did what i would have done that is the smarter thing why be a royal with all of the scrutiny when you can marry yeah. a legit billionaire and have a yacht right like Amen. so much better yes is this enough i think i know the answer but did you watch this wedding when it was televised i did of course i did oh my god i mean it was the first the first royal wedding that i got to witness <laughs> my home on the TV. But of course, like, you know, I ate it up with everybody else. And like I said, like her dress will forever be in my brain. It was just beautiful. And she looked beautiful and he looked great. And it was a whole thing. I was, though, I think that was the first time where I sort of started to disconnect from the fantasy of it all and start to feel like this is a little bit too much. And it's a little Mm -hmm. strange because also remembering that She was just in her late 20s. I mean, it must have felt so strange. I don't know. It's a lot. And to know that millions are watching you at home, I don't know. I agree. She seemed into it, though. Like, she she was so joyful. She didn't seem nervous. Like, watching that, I remember when they were engaged, I was worried. I sort of thought, oh, my God, is she going to be destroyed by the press like Diana was? Like, I mean, Diana was just hounded by the press. And she was somebody who, I mean, she was really abused by the institution of the monarchy. Uh, But what struck me about Kate when she walked in the aisle is how much agency she seemed to have. Like, she really seemed happy and certain and confident like this was her choice. And I guess, I mean, she was a decade older than Diana when she got married. And that just shows why you shouldn't get married as an adolescent. Um, in, In the odd case, it turns out well, but People really do need to be given that space to grow grow up and be sure of their decisions. And it really did seem like Kate knew what she was getting into and was sure of herself. Kate and William, just they're wearing their joy on their faces. Like, I remember him smiling at her at the altar. And I just remember also being like, oh. Mm -hmm. And then the mouth readers found out that he said, you look beautiful, babe. Which is like such a basic thing to say, but it's also sweet because that's what so many men say to the women they're marrying when they see them. Yeah, and I remember people did it again with Meghan and Harry, but I got, I remember people replaying that endlessly and oh God, of course I ate it up. Jesus, yeah. So the nation rejoiced at the wedding of Kate and William, buying commemorative mugs and tea towels. But Kate's newlywed phase was not without complications. Illegally taken paparazzi pics of Kate sunbathing topless were published in a French tabloid in 2012, for which Kate was later awarded £92,000 in damages. Similar pap shots were published of Kate's naked bottom. In 2013, acclaimed Wolf Hall novelist Hilary Mantel also criticized Kate for being, quote, painfully thin. Despite not knowing the Duchess personally, Mantel also insisted that Kate had, quote, no personality. I mean, she's not wrong about the second one, but how can I say that either? I have a less to know about her than Hilary Mantel does anyway. <laughs> well, like, I don't know her. Like, I do think it is unfair for us to say she doesn't have a personality when it the is, role of the royal is. family is essentially to be... Uh, a completely neutral person who who has no no opinions, right? Like, how could we know her person? And that sucks, right? Yeah. It sucks that that's what the role yeah. is. Uh, but like, because of that, that's her job not to have a personality. Yeah. So faulting her for it is to me a little bit odd. Um, Fair enough. 
I'm sure she has some kind of mild interests. I don't think she's super excited. Mom. I also feel like I'm sure she has she has preferences. You're right. You're right. <laughs> you're right. You're right. So Despite all of this, Kate was unflappable. She embarked on royal tours around the world, posing in beautiful but often recycled dresses, making her relatably glamorous. She quickly produced three gorgeous babies, dutifully posing with her newborns on the steps of the Lindo Wing hours after giving birth, a custom Meghan Markle later pushed back on when she delivered Archie. Even rumors of her husband William's infidelity, rumors that my research suggests lack solid evidence, did not seem to ruffle Kate. She remained calm and collected. Kate also worked with William and Harry to launch Heads Together in 2016, a campaign designed to fight the stigma surrounding mental illness. Kate also happens to be an advocate for the well-being of parents and families, speaking candidly about the challenges of being a mother um, and candidly by royal standards, (laughs) not candidly by mom on the street standards. In an interview with podcaster Giovanna Fletcher, which I I love that name, Giovanna Fletcher, great name. The Duchess was asked if she experienced mom guilt. Her response, yes, absolutely. And anyone who doesn't as a mother is actually lying. And I like that. I do too. In that same interview, she even admits like when they first had George and brought him home and he like wouldn't stop screaming, um, William kind of regretted having kids. Oh, wow. Really? Yeah. yeah, they got over it quickly, but he asked like, oh my God, is this what our life is going to be like forever? Like, have we ruined our lives? Which is something that a lot of people ask when they bring home a baby that won't yeah. stop screaming. I was, parents are going to hate me, I was blessed with a baby who wanted to sleep and my biggest problem was waking her up in wow. the middle of the night to feed Sarah. her. She did lose more than 10% of her birth weight, slightly more, because it was so hard to feed her. She'd get so pissed when I woke her up in the middle of the night. Um, <laughs> Anyway, I I can relate to like the challenges and when you're all sleep deprived and hormonal being like, what the fuck is this ever going to get easier? Yeah. Well, I mean, royals are supposed to project perfection, right? So for him to say that, that's actually incredible. Mm -hmm. And it makes you think of them like the fact that she tells that story about him where she's speaking for him. Yeah. It makes them sound like a normal couple. (laughs) Like she's not afraid to speak for him and tell a story about him on a podcast makes it feel like their marriage is real. Um, and it's a little moment of vulnerability on the part of yeah. the royal couple. Um, you know, they don't have a lot of those moments. No, no, they're very careful. But yeah, they're real. Like, that's that moment. Well, in recent years, one of the biggest news stories concerning Kate Middleton is the alleged feud with Meghan Markle. So we have to address that. That's mm-hmm. important. While the feud turned out to be a fabrication by sexist media outlets, according to my research, that's what it seems like, um, who wanted a cat fight. One genuine conflict has become public. Um, In 2018, news reports of Kate crying after a row over the children's outfits for Meghan's wedding to Harry became public. The casually racist depiction of the story was that Meghan had nastily made poor innocent Kate cry. So there is this, there are these, um, there are these gross racial undertones there. And, you know, Kate, the white mother of the nation is is sad and vulnerable here. The white mother of the nation. Oof. I mean, that's kind of how she's being portrayed. Exactly. Um, it. Yeah. In this narrative. And then later, Megan contradicted that narrative in 2021 when she sat down for an intimate interview with Oprah. And we're going to play that clip right now. Did you make Kate cry? No. So where did that come from? Was there a situation where she might have cried or she could have no, cried? No, the no. reverse happened. And I don't say that to be disparaging to anyone because it was a really hard week of the wedding and she was upset about something, but she owned it and she apologized and she brought me flowers and a note apologizing. And she did what I would do if I knew that I hurt someone, right? To just take accountability for it. What was shocking was, what was that, six, seven months after our wedding? Uh That the reverse of that would be out in the world. Oh, this makes me so mad. Well, in the palace papers, Tina Brown's research suggests the row was over Megan's non-traditional choice for the kids not to wear stockings under their bridesmaids' gowns, which like, you know, everyone has the right to do what they want to do for their wedding. Right? But it was also a really hot day, right? Like, that's why she pushed for that. Yeah, I mean, it's like one of those things where everyone's going to make the choices they're going to make for the reasons they're going to make yeah. them. You probably shouldn't get mad at someone when your kids are in their wedding for the choices that they make. Yeah. Like that's not okay. That's that's unseemly. But Brown also believes that 
She thinks, based on her research, that it's likely that both women had tearful meltdowns that day. If that did happen, it was understand. It would have been understandable because, I mean, Kate was newly postpartum, having just given birth to her child, Louis, um, you know. And when I was postpartum, I had a lot of rage issues <laughs> and had picked a lot of fights that I would not otherwise have picked yeah. um, that I did later have to apologize for. And in Meghan's case, she was about to become the first known person of color to marry a major British royal, and she was experiencing a lot of racist scrutiny from the press. So it makes sense that tensions were running high and that, you know, maybe both women were upset or one was upset. It, like, it is understandable that a conflict would happen. But one conflict does not make a feud, yeah. especially when Megan herself has said Kate sent flowers to apologize and referred to her sister-in-law as, quote, a good person on, re- on TV. In reality, it's likely that the two women never had a feud, that the media wanted them to be in a cat fight, and that they simply didn't become close because they don't really have much in common, which is true for so many in-laws. I mean, it's so classic, right? We've talked about this in other episodes. People Mm -hmm. just eat up the idea of women just being completely catty and tearing each other apart and this idea that women are always in competition. But that's not true. I mean, you and I could be in competition with each other, but instead we've joined forces somehow. Mm -hmm. Like it happens, people. But like, I think it's, again, it's what we were saying before. It's just more fun. And as viewers and people who are seeing this from the outside, like it's, interesting. It makes you hungry for more. You want the drama. You want the chaos. You want to believe it a little bit. And then that ends up feeding into it. That's even something Megan talked about in that interview, right? That the press has Mm -hmm. basically been this other party in their family this whole time. And the Mm -hmm. fact that they even managed to reverse what actually happened in our minds is pretty wild. You start to wonder not only how much does the family control things, but how much does the press control things? So... I I don't know. I have to assume that it's just fun for people to think that this is something interesting, but I've never found it amusing at all. Like I go back all the way to the years of Christina versus Britney. I hated Mm -hmm. that. Mm -hmm. So I don't, I don't really get it. Why do you think people love that so much? Well, I mean, the world loves the cafe. We, I mean, the tabloids are still milking Jennifer Aniston versus Angelina Jolie. They won't let go of that. Uh, And I think you're right that we assume two women are in competition with each other if they're in a similar field and they're, you know, you know, they're both royalty. So they're in a similar field. Yeah, they're in the same field. They are. Yeah, same field, same field. (laughs) Um, And also, I think the truth was just boring and the press couldn't run with that. The boring truth, like these women have nothing in common. And like so many sisters in law just, you know, are going to see each other at family events, but aren't going to text each other. That's boring. That's not a story. Yeah. And again, it's more romantic that they do have some level of closeness, right? But I mean, I totally agree with you. These women were not close. No, they weren't close. And honestly, like, if you know anything about them, you know that they just don't like doing the same things. And that's why they could never really be good friends. Yeah. And Harry pretty much said the same thing, right? In the same Oprah interview that he's not that close with William. And so that makes it even harder to believe that Megan and um, Kate had some kind of close connection. Come on now. So in the palace papers, Tina Brown also observes of Kate. And I agree with this. There is a Mona Lisa quality to her. No one can quite figure out what she's thinking. I think that that is very apt. Even when Louis is misbehaving and pulling his cousin's hair during a televised Jubilee celebration, Kate never loses her cool. You can't tell that she's frustrated or upset. She's just stoic. However, yeah. it's that Mona Lisa quality, that reticence, that refusal to share her more candid thoughts that frustrates many feminists, myself included. Historically, Kate hasn't spoken out on any social justice issues that are considered remotely controversial. In 2018, in support of the Me Too movement, women attendees were black to the BAFTA awards. Kate, however, was a notable exception. She wore an olive green gown instead. While the royal family are constitutionally obliged to be a political in public, many feminists wondered how on earth taking a stand against sexual assault and harassment could be a partisan issue. And I think that's a good question. Um, And of course, there was William and Kate's disastrous 2022 tour of the Bahamas and the Caribbean, where Kate shook hands with Jamaican children through a wire fence. (laughs) She and her husband were met by frequent protesters and were told by Bahamian officials to apologize for the royal family's history of brutal colonialism. Kate and William stayed mum on the issue, even though colonial practices such as slavery are objectively wrong and horrifying and should not require royal neutrality. You should just be able to say that was wrong. We're sorry. Yeah. 
Despite her silence on any issues deemed controversial by the firm, the nickname for the royal family, there is the odd moment where we get a window into what looks like Kate's secret feminist sensibility. In March of 2021, 33-year-old Sarah Everard was abducted, raped, and murdered by Wayne Cousins while walking home one evening through Clapham Common, a local London park. Cousins was a Metropolitan Police officer. He told Sarah he was arresting her for violating COVID-19 protocols, but in reality, he was abducting her. The incident demonstrated how easy it is for police to abuse their power. When Sarah's murder became public, the incident was met with vile victim blaming from the police who suggested women simply shouldn't walk home at night. In response, thousands of women descended on Clapham Common for a vigil for Sarah, which was also a protest against the Metropolitan Police. Many in attendance held, quote, defund the police signs. Video of the vigil also shows Kate Middleton was in attendance. She was quietly visiting in an unofficial capacity. She didn't come as a princess. She came as a woman and as the mother of a daughter. Vigil was eventually broken up by the cops and several arrests were made. And that moment, I think, is a rare moment of authenticity where you see the type of advocate she could be if she could speak her mind. Um, So why do we think Kate doesn't speak out more about issues she seems to care about, like violence against women? Do we think she's muzzled by the royal family or do we think it's her choice to be the silent bride who declines to take a stand and therefore remains popular and isn't polarizing? I think it's both, right? I mean, I think there's obviously so much pressure from them for her to be the upstanding one, just as Mm -hmm. um, Tina Brown put it, that I do think to them she is probably essential to upholding the monarchy and what they believe they are and how they stand. But At the same time, I don't think anybody is holding a gun to her head, literally. Mm -hmm. So she could speak out, just like Harry has and just like Meghan has. And she's never chosen to do that. And it really, really bothers me because I think there's been so many moments. And Mm -hmm. I, the last thing I want to do is compare tragedies. But I do think it's questionable that she has never spoken up about anything that was race-related. But when it came to something involving the death of a white woman, that's when Mm she made some kind Kind of um, a symbolic move, which I do think is great that she did do that. I'm actually shocked. I, I was surprised when that happened, but it's it's for me, it's too little too late um, yeah. because also Harry at this point, Harry and Meghan have already kind of broken that veneer that mm-hmm. they hold up. So it's made it also easier for her. And she frankly still is not doing enough. I think in her position, if you're not doing anything, then you are actively part of the problem. And the same, by the way, goes for William. I don't think it's all on Kate, but yeah, this is not a feminist to me. Mm-hmm. I mean, I just, I don't, I would like more of that from her. I w- hope she does one day, but. Well, I don't think she's necessarily no. a feminist. I think she understands feminism is correct, but isn't willing to take a stand, right? And I think yes. there are many famous women who don't put their money where their mouth is, even though they objectively are smart enough to understand that feminism and intersectional feminism make excellent points and the world should go that way. And I think that that's what we were seeing from her, that it's almost like a confession. Like, I know that I probably should have worn black to the BAFTAs. I know that the world is a messed up place and that the police do not protect vulnerable communities. But you're right, because Sarah Everard was, you know, conventionally successful and conventionally attractive um, and white that she becomes like a palatable victim, right? Yeah, and by the way, like I'm sure the royal family gave her plenty of shit just for doing that. And I know it's not easy. We know what Diana went through and what you end up facing in the family if you decide to stand up and say something. But I don't know. I also feel like that knowing that you have as big of an impact Mm -hmm. as you do and that you have this platform that you do I'm Mm -hmm. sorry, but that just outweighs that, right? I agree. And Kate now has said mild things speaking out against violence against women. I don't... Mild is the word. (laughs) So anyway, it would be nice to see her take more of a stand. At the same time, I just don't think the institution is set up for her to do that. Like, I just don't think she... I I think you're right that she would get a lot of shit from her um, in-laws for doing that. And that might make her personal life harder. Like, I don't know. So the time has come for Hindsight is 2022, the segment where Sadaf and I talk about what we might have done differently if we were the subject of today's story. I shouldn't have done that. 
that, what would you have done differently? Oh boy, so many things. <laughs> um, <laughs> if I were William, I would have married my cousin. <laughs> Or Kate, I would have married a billionaire okay. outside of the royal family. I just want I want the royals to leave other amazing women alone. You know, don't suck them into your void. Who knows who she could have been if she didn't marry that man? And again, keeping it in the family is what they seem to like. And I also ultimately do wish that I the only person I always think about now when it comes to Kate is Megan, because mm-hmm. I think that she's become the royal that we need, right? And Mm -hmm. she's like a modern day superhero in that way who can intersect and jump into this Mm -hmm. fairy tale that is not actually the fairy tale we thought it was. So I just Mm -hmm. wish that Kate never made Megan cry. That's all I want. (laughs) What about you, Sarah? I mean, I think that that's fair. I I agree. I mean, she shouldn't have criticized the little bridesmaids dresses. Come Uh, on. Yeah, that's quibbling. At the same time, I do... (laughs) I can kind of relate to that moment because I was like really hormonal when I was that newly postpartum. And I think- you make a good point. And listen, I've never been there, so I can't imagine what it feels like. And yeah. And, and again, it's like you were saying before, it's one moment out of this whole re- relationship or non-relationship they've had. And that's what we end up using to judge these people. It's the same case for all of it. Mm-hmm, exactly. I mean, there is definitely misogyny there where we're so desperate yeah. for them not to like each other that we take the one moment where they had a conflict and try to say that's representative of their whole relationship. Yeah. Um, what I would have done differently, I think you're right. I think Kate should have just married a billionaire. Uh, yeah. We should all marry billionaires if we have the opportunity. <laughs> yes, I think that's what I would have done. And had I been Carol, I think I would have encouraged that too because it's just a better life with less scrutiny. Um, so I think I would have just said like, Focus on marrying rich, not marrying royal. Imagine that those are the lanes available to you. Royal, billionaire. Yeah, I mean, I actually... What a life. As a mother, I probably (laughs) would have encouraged my kid to just get a job. But I guess if you know your daughter's personality and you're like, eh, I don't know if she's going to do the work-a-day life, then you you suggest the the best possible alternative to that. Yeah, I think that's very fair. Mm -hmm. I mean, and also, Kate, like, I don't want to portray her as as idol. Like, yes, she didn't really have a career, but like, she's a mother of three children. And according to my research, she's very involved. She drives them to school. She does activities with them. Like that is work. And she's very privileged. She has more help than the vast majority of mothers do. Um, and a lot of financial security and connections, but like, I I don't want to dismiss that mother work is, is real work, but like she didn't, according to my research, seem interested in having like gainful employment. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Like, she could have been a great accessories buyer, but she decided to be a princess instead. And, you know, that's her choice. Listen, I can completely understand if someone would rather be a royal than have a nine to five. So, (laughs) fine. (laughs) Yeah, I... I don't know. I actually can't. We can't for us, right? But for other people, listen, I see. I see what's attracting you and turning you on. Go for it. I wouldn't personally go for a balding man, but i that's one of many things that I take issue with. He had hair when she met him. But then look at his father. I mean, God, I just... I don't mind balding men. Like, I think that we as a society need to get You're over right. how, how we feel about balding men. I don't think it's fair. I, I love Stanley Tucci. I mean, William is not sexy like Stanley Tucci. Like, she did not marry Stanley Tucci. I think Felicity Blunt, like, she married well. That woman, like, should write a book about how to marry well. Um, she could even teach Kate a thing or two. But I think William is like, you know, he's fine. There's He's an attractive guy. He's fine. There's nothing... Yeah. I don't find him off-putting. Um, like, Physically, I don't know his personality. I don't know Listen, him as a human. Listen, the man has not proposed to either of us. <laughs> <laughs> it doesn't matter. Like, would I accept his proposal? It's like, we don't know him. He probably wouldn't like us. <laughs> he wouldn't? No, he would not. No, we don't eat muesli. <laughs> we don't eat muesli. He would not. No. He'd be like, what is wrong with these people? I'd be all up in that fry up at university at St. <laughs> Andrews. I'd be eating the sausages and he would just think that I was going to die of a heart attack at 35. We're too interesting. It would never be more flattering to not be proposed to. (laughs) Yes, exactly. Let's decide it's William chose Kate and not us, people he's never met, because we are too interesting. Listen, (laughs) it must be said. Yes. All right. Well, that's good. All right. That was some good (laughs) self-love. 
All right. Well, that brings us to the end of today's episode. <laughs> As always, we hope you enjoyed this episode. Now, if you want to hear more from me, you can find me on Twitter at underscore Sadafasan. Sarah, where can our listeners find you? Listeners can find me at Sarah Sahagian. And of course, we'd like to issue a heartfelt thank you to our wonderful producer, Joe. If you like this podcast, please rate, review, and subscribe so other listeners can find us too. Thanks for listening. 